John F. Kennedy Jr. was an American prince, the son of a beloved president and a beautiful trend-setting aristocrat. The enormity of the experience that this kid had to go through is amazing. My father stood before you. He carried the weight of public expectation on his shoulders. He knew that he was being groomed. He knew that everyone had a plan. Hounded by paparazzi and constant gossip column headlines, John takes refuge in his passion for flying. John, are we lost? No, we're fine, we're fine. John! I miss the little boy I knew. I miss him so much, you know. Why did he decide to fly that evening, risking his own life and the lives of his loved ones? City, July 15th, 1999. John Kennedy Jr. begins the last 24 hours of his life. He is more than a celebrity. He's American royalty. A cultural icon. It's early evening, and John is meeting his wife, Carolyn, and her sister, Lauren, at the Stanhope Hotel Bar in New York City. He's nursing a broken ankle, sustained when he crash-landed his ultralight aircraft six weeks ago. John, Carolyn, and Lauren had planned to fly to the wedding of John's cousin, Rory Kennedy, but there's a problem. John's marriage is in trouble, and Carolyn doesn't want to go. John moved out of the couple's Tribeca loft to a room here at the Stanhope Hotel just two days ago. Well, John had had a fight with Carolyn, and she was such a high-maintenance person that you didn't make up with her in five minutes. It, it would take hours or maybe, maybe even days to make up with her from one of their big fights. And uh, so he stayed at a hotel. He went off and stayed at a hotel. Again, it didn't mean they were separating. It just meant the, the intensity of their argument and how the seriousness of the discussions they would have to have. They both had a very strong temper, te not temper, but um, character. You know, Caroline had a very, very strong character. Caroline has been overwhelmed by the public attention that follows John everywhere he goes. She didn't know who she was. Uh, she got lost a little bit, and that was a big problem. Well, John had no idea when he married Carolyn that she would be on it. She would be unable to deal with the media pressure. After all, she was in public relations beforehand. She seemed to love to be in the limelight. She seemed to be the perfect wife for John. But immediately after their honeymoon, they come back to the their flat in Soho, and. Uh, she can't deal with it. She, there, there are the photographers waiting there. She simply can't deal with it, and she becomes a recluse. She, she just stays in that apartment for days on end. I won't take no for an answer. In an effort to broker a compromise, Carolyn's sister, Lauren Bassett, has pressured the couple to meet for drinks. Please. It'll be a great idea. We'll all fly up together, and we'll have fun. She encourages them to put aside their differences, at least for the weekend, and go as planned to John's cousin's wedding. Why don't you just put the last few weeks behind you? I just want this to stop. I just... What is the matter with you two? Excuse me. John cherishes Kennedy family that. gatherings. She's so stubborn, my little sister. It's a chance for him to shed the public persona and relax with people who've shared triumphs and tragedies with him all his life. The Kennedys have had so much tragedy. They're used to circling the wagons, they're used to pulling together, grieving together, and resolving together. I've never seen a family like it. They're always there for one another. I want to try. Let's Carolyn try finally together. agrees. They will all fly together tomorrow Such afternoon. Freak. But I love you for it. John, Carolyn, and Lauren have just 23 hours to live. 
John F. Kennedy Jr. lived his entire life in the public eye. He was America's most eligible bachelor and, according to People magazine, the sexiest man alive. He dated film stars and married the socialite Carolyn Bessett. He was on tabloid front pages and a regular in celebrity gossip columns. He wasn't thrown into a fire or a, media, a glare of media lights. He grew up there. I mean, he was the best at it. But it had this innocence about it. And that is probably the greatest lesson I've learned from my friend. Don't be cynical. And to hear it from him was a beautiful thing. I'm not a political leader, but I can speak for those of my age. John lived with endless speculation about whether he had the ability to follow in the footsteps of a father he never knew. Thirty-eight years earlier, John Kennedy Jr. made history as the first child born to a U.S. president-elect. John and Jackie Kennedy took Washington by storm, ushering in a whole new era. The whole thing just changed. The wines, the food, the way people dressed, the way people felt about coming to the White House. The people who were honored there, the Nobel Prize winners, the intellects, the the great museum directors, the university presidents. The guest lists were quality, 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 instead of politics, politics, politics. The interest in it was unprecedented in American history. The magazines, the covers of the magazines, television, newspapers, radio, just nothing but the Kennedys. John and his sister Caroline's enchanted childhood was constantly documented by an adoring media. Kennedy's being the first television administration, as it were, were really a novelty in, in American history. And, and young, vibrant, uh, energetic, charismatic couple with the two golden children. I mean, <clears throat> the first two kids to grow up in the White House since I think the days of Grover Cleveland. Little John just caught everybody's hearts. He was so handsome and so natural and responsive. But soon this idyllic time would be cut short by tragedy. John Kennedy Jr. has less than 22 hours to live. His marriage is in trouble and he's living alone in a New York hotel. Earlier this evening, John and his wife Carolyn were reconciled thanks to her sister Lauren. Now he's turned his attention to problems with work. Four years ago, John launched a political magazine called George, but now sales have slowed and the magazine is floundering. John is up late, struggling to create a business plan to save the venture. He had a magazine that was in trouble. It might fold if he didn't get an infusion of cash. George was an important uh, stepping stone for John Jr. It was, um, it was something that he, uh, endeavored to do prior to entering the field of politics, which I think he recognized as an inevitable uh, uh, part of his life. John will meet his publisher in the morning. His attempt to be regarded as a serious player in publishing will be tested. Dealing with the bare-bone business of George was difficult uh, for him. He did not enjoy it. He had to put on a suit and go into the boardroom and get berated. John is under maximum stress, just when his life will depend on clear thinking. It's been a long day. He needs to get some sleep. Tomorrow morning's meeting could determine John Jr.'s fledgling political career. Thirty-six years earlier, President John Kennedy and his spirited two-year-old son had developed a unique bond. President Kennedy was so thrilled to have a son but he was like every father. Every father is thrilled to have a son. And here was this beautiful boy. And so he loved it when little John came to his office and examined everything and played with everything. But on November 22nd, 1963, John Kennedy Jr.'s charmed childhood ended with a gunshot. His father was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. The 
president was buried on John's third birthday. He said often that he remembered nothing of his father, not, not even that famous scene where he's saluting the uh, horse-drawn uh, carriage that's carrying his father's body. This image would haunt John for the rest of his life. He was, in a way, uh, in search of his father his entire life. John Kennedy Jr. will spend much of his life trying to live up to the expectations of a man he can barely remember. The assassination changed everything. The White House suddenly closed up like a clamshell. Usually the place was full of happy chatter and the clicking of heels on those marble hallways. But all of a sudden, it was just deathly silence. It was a grief-stricken house. It was a watershed. America had this endless optimism and promise that one sees dissipating from that day. Just two weeks later, John left the White House, where he'd spent the first three years of his life. Jackie and her two children moved into a house in Georgetown, an elegant house. But it was surrounded by paparazzi and by journalists and by tourists. What was so terrible about it <clears throat> was that they couldn't go anywhere or do anything without being besieged by the press, the media. They had sightseeing buses that would stop in front of the house. Um, <clears throat> Carolyn Kennedy and her brother John would leave the house and people would pounce on them and tear at them and grab their clothes. It was impossible for her to have the, the real uh, life she wanted to have for her family. In less than a year, Jackie fled with her children to New York City. Desperate for a father figure for her young son, Jackie turned to Bobby Kennedy. Robert Kennedy's courage and determination to follow in his brother's footsteps and run for the presidency made a huge impression on John Jr. Joseph Kennedy, the Kennedy patriarch, really had trained his sons that one must pick up the banner for the next. Now it was Bobby's turn to, to take up that banner and to get to the White House himself. I thank to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago and let you in there. But on June 6, 1968, the unimaginable happened. Just five years after the death of his father, John Jr.'s uncle, Robert Kennedy, was shot and killed as he campaigned for the leadership of the Democratic Party. Now, seven-year-old John Jr. was fatherless again. As an adult, John Kennedy Jr. was reluctant to speak about the tragedy he experienced as a child. But the media speculated endlessly and dubbed it the curse of the Kennedys. The title I selected for this book, The Kennedys' Dynasty and Disaster, made a lot of sense. There seems to be some kind of a curse hanging over the Kennedys. On John's last day, the curse would strike again. John Kennedy Jr. has 14 hours to live. Last night, he reconciled with his estranged wife, Carolyn, who agreed to join him at a family wedding at Martha's Vineyard. John plans to take Carolyn and her sister, Lauren, in his light aircraft. They plan to leave at 5.30 this afternoon. But John Jr. has a busy day ahead. He's already tired, having worked long into the night preparing a new business plan to save George, his political magazine, from financial disaster. This morning, John will present his new plan to the bosses at Hachette Filipacci Publishing. John's hopes for his future depend on the outcome of this meeting. Gentlemen, always ready for the you, sir. Have a seat. Klieger told him, it's over. It's done. We're not going to pick you up. Uh, after your five-year contract is done, we've, we've, we've done wonderfully with the magazine. We feel you've been a great success, but it's time to move on. John knows Hachette's CEO, Jack Klieger, is tough, but he's determined to turn the situation around. The business plan that he had presented was a strategic plan, but it didn't have, um, in my opinion, enough specific tactical um, executions that I could then go and present that to my bosses and 
feel comfortable yeah, with that presentation. Over, yeah? John was very interested in expanding the George brand, and I agreed that it was uh, a, an important uh, um, element of what we were doing, uh, or what we could do. Um, John obviously was a, was a magnet to be on television being interviewed, but he didn't really want it to be John Kennedy as the driving force. He wanted George to be there, so he wanted to get more of his editors and more of the content onto both the television and the internet. Now, Hachette wants John to trade on the Kennedy question. name, but sure John has other ideas, yet. and that's Frame frustrated the publisher's executives. I would like your input. He got very, very specific, and his eyes got very straight when he, he, he said he didn't want his name taken advantage of by the company. This is not a comfortable experience for John, but no one would ever know. He's a man who's learned too well to hide behind his public persona. With his charm offensive, the meeting goes better than expected. So we went through a number of, um, of um, specifics that I wanted him to get into, which he was prepared to do and was, uh, was, was willing to do. Um, but he was upbeat. He thought he could have those specifics ready for me uh, by the end of that day, which I said, that's fine. We're on the right track, John. John manages to buy himself some time, time he doesn't have. Glad have a great day. By the age of eight, John Kennedy Jr. had lost both his father and his uncle to violent assassinations. At that point, Jackie said, uh, my God, if they're killing Kennedys, then my kids are next. Uh, and this is what led to the marriage with Aristotle Onassis. Jackie's courtship with Onassis was pounced on by the media and made international headlines. Aristotle Onassis was Greek, and he was the richest man on, on, on the planet Earth. Jackie married Onassis in part because she liked money, and the Kennedys hadn't really left her that much money. Less than five months after the death of Robert Kennedy, John's mother marries self-made shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis. But the American public was outraged. Jackie had betrayed their trust by apparently casting aside the sacred memory of their fallen hero. Americans loved Jackie, but they loved her not as a woman with her own life. They loved her as the eternal widow. With her children protected by the Anassis' private security force, John's life regained stability. Aristotle Anassis lavished time, love, and money on John Jr. I think he liked Ari Onassis a lot. <clears throat> I think Ari liked him a lot, and I think he found Ari to be a very interesting, avuncular sort of figure. But this oasis of calm was not destined to last. Within three years, the marriage between Aristotle Onassis, the Greek self-made billionaire, and Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, the Virginia blue blood, began to fall apart. I think that the fact that they were so um, oil and water-ish, night and day-ish, have you call it what you will, I mean, his ideal of fun was to um, sit around in, in a nightclub uh, till three in the morning, breaking glasses, dancing the Greek dances, singing the Greek songs, whereas Jackie liked to curl up with a good book at 9 p.m. Then, tragedy once again reshapes John Jr.'s life. Aristotle Onassis loses his only son, Alexander, in a plane crash. For the Greek, as as the Kennedys used to refer to Aristotle Onassis, for the Greek to lose his one and only son was for Aristotle Onassis an absolutely tragic, traumatic, uh, life-ending event. Unable to cope with his loss, Ari severed all ties with young John. For the third time in less than 10 years, John Jr. lost a father figure. Just after midday, John is busy in his Manhattan office. The meeting with his publisher is forgotten as John hits the ground running. As the editor-in-chief of the magazine, he's got to push the next issue out the door. He had deadlines. He had uh, uh, to do so many things, and he was responsible. 
And it became, I think it became a little stressful. He explained to me once that when the magazine has to go out, has to go out. And sometimes you have to be there all night. Locked into a frenetic pace, John is about to make a series of minor mistakes that will mean the difference between life and death. Hello. At 1 p.m., he gets a call from Essex Airport and arranges for his Piper Saratoga to be fueled and ready for 5.30 p.m. But as the afternoon unfolds, his departure plan will be delayed. Need that 10 minutes ago. Good ending. 1.05 p.m., a pilot he regularly flies with calls to ask if he needs a co-pilot. John inexplicably refuses the offer. The strangest, most inexplicable thing that happened that last day was that John didn't take a co-pilot with him. He was such a careful pilot that of the 200 or so hours he had flown, he had an inordinate number with a co-pilot. I mean, most pilots with 200 hours would not have had 70 or 80 percent of those hours with the pilot beside him. But he knew he wasn't a great pilot. Why John didn't take the pilot with him is one of those things we're just never going to know. 4.30 p.m. The drive to Essex Airport takes about an hour. If he's going to make his 5.30 departure and fly to Martha's Vineyard in daylight, he should leave now. But John takes time to email his friend John Barlow to offer condolences on the death of his mother. 4.30 p.m. Running late, John calls Jack Klieger and postpones their meeting until the following week. Hi, Jack. Hi. And he did call me at around 4.30 or so to say that uh, he'd gotten really backed up, uh, they were closing an issue, and he also had some other things he had to take care of, and he had to leave for the airport uh, that night, so he asked if he could get it to me the following week. Um, and I said, uh, that's fine, as, as long as you can see that it gets sent to me where I was just going to be on vacation that far away. So we agreed that I'd get it the following week, and, uh, and that was the uh, last conversation we had. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. 5 p.m., John calls his friend Billy Noonan and says he will not be able to make his anniversary celebration. They plan to meet later that weekend, but John will never see his friend again. 6.32 p.m., John logs on to the weather service. He reads that the conditions are hazy, visibility five miles. But John fails to take into consideration that the measuring device only sees what is directly above. That machine is only looking straight up in the sky. So in other words, if you have a clear sky right over the machine, the machine will report clear sky. But if you have 500 feet away, a layer of fog surrounding the machine, the machine still will report a clear sky unless that fog is right over the machine. Hello? John hasn't flown alone in his Piper Saratoga since he broke his ankle six weeks ago but he's too busy putting out fires at George magazine to calmly evaluate his plan to fly. 6.40 p.m. John leaves the office more than two hours later than intended. He's neglected to calculate the additional time he will lose driving in Friday rush hour traffic. When you learn to fly, you are taught to follow certain procedures, checking the weather, doing a pre-flight inspection, checking yourself, making sure that you know, you're feeling up to it. If you skip one of them, it opens the door for error. John has made a number of errors in judgment this afternoon. In less than three hours, he'll be dead. Twenty-two years earlier, John celebrated his 16th birthday at the Kennedy compound. Despite the numerous tragedies he'd faced, friends say he embraced life with energy and enthusiasm. Some strange appreciation of life, uh, this desire to go out and do things, to see things, a curious, like a cat. He was just curious. He wanted to see everything and do everything. But John was, at best, an average student. Teachers said he had difficulty concentrating in class. He had a problem with ADD, attention deficit disorder. Uh, started taking medication for that when he was a teenager, and uh, Jackie sent him to a therapist in New York for that reason. His mother wanted John to toughen up and experience life away from the Kennedy compound. 
she sent him to Guatemala as a Peace Corps volunteer, and the following summer on an outward bound survival course. Jackie was worried that her son wasn't serious. She was worried he's gonna get in trouble, get off, get off the right path. He's just gonna be a playboy. It was during this period that John discovered a new passion, acting. He loved it. He loved it. His first was Cyrano of Bergerac. He was great on Cyrano. John was a charmer. A charmer snake. He, he was in, on stage. He was just on his element. You know, he loved it. For John, acting was a chance to do his own thing and to escape for a moment the Kennedy name. He was, in fact, um, very charming, playing roles of down and outers, alcoholics. Uh, this was what he was best at, not playing somebody from his own background. It gave him the freedom to be someone other than himself. Deliberately avoiding Princeton and Harvard, where his father studied, John enrolled as a freshman at the smaller and more liberal Brown University. There, he was constantly monitored. Jackie watched over John very closely, often in ways he didn't even know. I mean, she, she got his grades, she'd call his professors. She, she was omnipresent. Jackie made sure John knew he must fulfill his duties as a Kennedy. He was often drafted in to introduce his Uncle Teddy at political functions. Ladies and gentlemen, my Uncle Ted Kennedy. And when he wanted to apply to drama school as a graduate student, Jackie insisted he study law. It was Jackie who ultimately put her foot down regarding his uh, acting career and who said, look, you know, you're going to go to law school and you're going to study law and you're going to work. Succumbing to intense pressure, John suppressed his passion for acting and reluctantly entered New York University Law School. It was the first step towards accepting his Kennedy inheritance. John is already more than two hours late for his scheduled flight. It's almost 7 p.m. when he picks up Lauren, his wife's sister. John originally planned to fly out of Essex County Airport for Martha's Vineyard at 5.30. But driving in Friday rush hour traffic, it will take him over an hour to get there, and he'll be forced to make the last crucial minutes of his flight in darkness. With no break in the traffic, John and Lauren are still at least 45 minutes from the airport. He could have called to reschedule the flight, but he did not. John's wife, Carolyn, has spent the afternoon shopping for a dress to wear to the family wedding. She decided to travel alone to Essex Airport. Now she too is stuck in traffic. She does not confer with John and her sister about the delay. Carolyn and John have always had a tempestuous relationship. When they met, she was well connected in the fashion industry. He was America's most eligible bachelor. They met when Carolyn was a shopping consultant for Calvin Klein. John fell madly in love. They caught each other's eye, and that spark didn't go away. That spark turned into a big flame, <laughs> in many ways. They were America's golden couple. But by their last day, cracks have begun to appear. John has been accused of being insensitive. Some say Carolyn is controlling, a skilled manipulator. My wife called her a witch, but a good witch. And that she had this power about her, a mystery and an intelligence, I think, more than anything. She didn't necessarily not let you know what you were, she was thinking, but you knew that she understood you. She looked you in the eye, and you knew that she touched your soul a little bit. And you felt that, and you appreciated that in her. And John saw that right away with her. As I said, when I first saw her, I looked at the ground and. You know, tried to get out of the room, frankly. Uh, and they didn't even know each other that, that well yet. He, he was watching me react to her. And I think, you know, and a lot of people react that way to her. And that was attractive to him. They were two powerful personalities who couldn't seem to get along, even though they believed they were meant for each other. 
John and Carolyn's relationship was really based on the idea that they were soulmates, that they'd found the counterpoint of each other. They were talking about kids and, and talking about him becoming a senator, and uh, she'd smoothed out. John and Carolyn make slow progress towards the airport. Whatever their hopes, their future together will be cut tragically short. Slow news day, I guess, huh? John, you know, uh, a lot of people waiting for you here. Sure. How do you feel about this? Is it true that you passed the bar? Uh, apparently it's true. Yeah. I got the official word not long ago, so it's true. What do you mean, not long ago? John began his career in law as an assistant district attorney in New York City. Absolutely. What kind of cases are you looking forward to? Well, whatever they give me. John, get all this attention, add to the pressure, take it. Jackie was proud of her son, but her plans for John's future would soon be derailed. He said, I'm no Clarence Darrow. What do you want out of my life? He didn't enjoy being a lawyer. That kind of lifestyle didn't suit him. I mean, he wasn't a great DA. I mean, a lot of the bad guys were so delighted to meet John that they confessed. And uh, he, 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 he wasn't a prosecutor, OK? He was, a too, he was too nice to be a prosecutor. John became restless and dreamed of starting a political magazine. But the greatest obstacle to achieving this new goal would again be tragedy. When John was 33 years old, Jackie Kennedy was diagnosed with cancer. Putting his dreams aside, John devoted himself to the care of his mother. We always thought, oh, she's going to be OK. You know, because she told me, you know, I'm going to be OK. Don't now get nervous about it. But despite her courage and John's constant care, five months later, Jacqueline Kennedy Anassis was dead. What he suffered the most is after Madame died. It was a big, big void on his life. For John, it was extraordinarily sad, but it was the evocation, the birth of a man. I mean, the day after she died, there he was in front of her building on 1045th Avenue in a blue suit, talking to the press. My mother passed on. She was surrounded by her friends and her family. Her death was horrible. It was the saddest I've ever seen. But he came out of it with her spirit firmly behind him. It's a reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Jackie was gone. And although devastated by the loss, John Kennedy Jr. was now finally free to chart his own destiny. She told him on her deathbed, go use your name. You earned it. Delayed at the office and then by rush hour traffic, John Kennedy Jr. arrives at Essex Airport almost three hours behind schedule. He has less than two hours to live. John drops Lauren off at the terminal to wait for Carolyn while he drives to a nearby convenience store. He is relaxed as he goes about his normal routine, even though the sun is setting and it will soon be dark. Also, unknown to him, bad weather is moving in. I actually was planning on making that same trip from Caldwell to Martha's Vineyard about three, uh, three hours prior to uh, John F. Kennedy Jr.'s departure. But I chose to uh, cancel uh, due to the, uh, the reduced visibility in the weather. Another pilot who has just landed and is aware of the reduced visibility tries to warn John. If this pilot had found John, it is possible that he might have changed his mind about flying. But John is now at the convenience store, calmly signing autographs for excited well-wishers. He had decided before making the trip that he was going to do it by himself. John felt, well, look, I'm out of this contraption of my ankle. My ankle feels good. I'm taking pain pills, but nevertheless, I'm ready to go. For John, the physical limitation was a challenge. That was the Kennedy way. This is a family that's out there that lives on the edge. They feel somehow 
that uh, the only way that they can enjoy life is, is by living it to, in the most extreme sense. And if you do that enough, I mean, the odds are bound to take hold. He did not take excessive risks in the sense that I saw some of his other family members doing. But when it came to flying, he was almost anal. I went up with my family the week before, and I would have gone up the week after. When he landed, it was beautiful. You know, a lot of people said to me, why didn't you warn him? It would have been completely inappropriate for me to warn, to warn him or to give him advice, because I didn't know, I don't know his proficiency, I don't know, you know, what his skill level is, and I don't know if there's a pilot or an instructor on the airplane with him. It's now 8.25 p.m. John had originally planned to make this trip in daylight. Leaving now means that soon he will be flying in the dark over the Atlantic Ocean. Is that John's plane over there? Yes, that's John's plane. Is that his wife? Yes, that's his wife. Should go over? Let's go. Thank you. Tragically, one of Jackie Kennedy's last wishes would have saved her son's life had he kept his word. She exacted from John a promise that he wouldn't pursue flying lessons after her death, but after her death, he did, in fact, resume them. John couldn't resist his passion for flying. He began with ultralight planes, then bought a Cessna and quickly got his pilot's license. I know that um, he... He seemed very happy in an airplane when I was with him. It gave him a lot of joy, I know that. Three months before he died, John purchased a Piper Saratoga, a much faster, more powerful aircraft. Flying was his escape route from all the public attention. John had an illusion that ordinary people had a kind of freedom he didn't have. He didn't see that you and I are imprisoned in our way just as he was and he saw it in flying as a way to have that absolute freedom, go above the clouds and he was his own person. The year after his mother's death, John fulfilled an ambition she would have been proud of. He launched his political magazine, George. Ladies and gentlemen, meet George. To huge critical acclaim. The beginning of George was like an eagle taking off. Uh, for him, that he happened to be riding. Uh, he loved it, the creative process, the fact that he had come up with a business idea and it seemed to make sense. It wasn't just coming together because of his name. Uh, and the, 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 it, was, it was journalism. He loved that. Uh, his favorite part of George was talking to the Dalai Lama and, and, and uh, even Larry Flint. He loved this interview with Larry Flint because Larry's you know, the, kind of the ultimate rebel in a way. And you the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, that, that's who John... Uh, Larry Flint was an underdog. And that's who John associated with. I mean, how, how could John Kennedy Jr. be an underdog? That's who we thought he was. Politics is not merely pulling a lever on election day or covering a debate on Capitol Hill. Politics is really about personalities and ideas. It's about He found himself with George. It's about I mean, he, even if it failed, he knew all that magazine had done for him. And it had given an entree to a whole new world. <laughs> After years of trying to find his place in the world, it seemed that by his early 30s, John Jr. was poised to create his own version of what it means to be a Kennedy. It was a vision that, tragically, would never be realized. Why don't we see any lights, John? Oh, John! John Kennedy Jr. is about to fly with his wife and sister-in-law to a family wedding in Martha's Vineyard. Good, good, good. It is now 8.35 p.m. Only an hour of daylight remains. John should have left at 5.30. Each individual pilot has to make his own decision to fly after careful consideration of all the variables. Ready to taxi with Mike. Right turn around, northeast bound. Not permanent. 8.34 p.m. John contacts air traffic control. The conditions on the ground are slightly hazy. The problem with haze is that um, you can take off and the first 1,000 feet or so as you're climbing out could be clear. 
but when you get higher, you could enter a haze layer and not be prepared for it. Uh, and that happens very often in the summer. John is only certified for visual flight rules, or VFR. The theory behind VFR is that you will be able to maneuver the airplane by looking out the window and being able to determine the plane's relationship to the horizon. When the horizon is not visible, the pilot is essentially flying blind. To be certified to fly under these conditions, a pilot must go through rigorous training, learning to use only instruments to navigate. John has very limited expertise in instrument navigation and is not certified. As they take off, John has left a goodwill note, which he will never read. John's departure is now so late that Lauren's hosts for her weekend on Martha's Vineyard arrive to pick her up just as she is leaving. She's flying in with John and Carolyn. Are they here yet? Haven't seen the plane. We checked with air traffic. John could have filed a flight plan as he left, but he did not. It's a good idea, um, particularly on a night flight, to file a VFR flight plan. The advantage being that um, once you file and activate it, there will be someone waiting for you to cancel it when you arrive at your destination. Some people will say John took too many risks, but he had to take those risks to assert his own manhood. Yes, it was too much, but, but the question is how far and where do you stop? And he, he, he was somewhat addicted to it. He just needed the rush. Daylight is rapidly diminishing. In less than an hour, John, Carolyn, and Lauren will be dead. One year earlier, it seemed John Kennedy Jr. was set to fulfill the expectations of an adoring American public. His political magazine, George, was doing well. He was moving in all the right political circles, and he'd found the woman he wanted to spend his life with, publicist Carolyn Bessette. How was the honeymoon, John? Hold it, please, for us. Look this way. Oh. Foiling intense media speculation, he orchestrated a secret wedding on Cumberland Island off the Georgia coast. We weren't supposed to tell anybody. I remember when they told me, they told me in July. You know, it was a long time to keep it until September. I remember him pumping his fist that they'd gotten it done. Like, yes, we did it. Uh, to her satisfaction. And it was a wonderful wedding, it really was. The wedding made headlines around the world. They were portrayed as the perfect couple. But sparks flew between Carolyn and John from the moment they met. He liked the fact that there was trouble there. And it wasn't until he married her, he saw that the trouble wasn't going to end. She was strong, strong will. I mean, she had her own point of view. She, uh, she was not uh, uh, some little housewife or something like that that was just going to sit there. She had a, a sophisticated friends when she met him. She had a you know, nice life. She comes from a very nice family. I mean, she, she uh, had her own personality, and you know, she had her own point of view. As they faced up to their problems, the media onslaught was unbearable for Carolyn. There was always some guy lurking around and who, was, who would take her picture or run up to her or you know, just invade her space, and I don't think anybody can be prepared for that. Then rumors of Carolyn's drug use began to surface in the tabloids. Carolyn used coke the way most people uh, used coke from that generation when they partied. It's the chosen recreational drug of the fashion industry. Next, John was spotted with ex-girlfriends and affairs were suspected, something his friends dispute. He's a monogamous guy, frankly. You see his loyalty with his friends, it was the same things with his girlfriends. Uh, he had every skirt thrown at him on earth, frankly. 
Uh, yeah, it was, he was an innocent. He was very innocent on that level. Uh, and you'd like to think that he was a little maybe uh, more mysterious, but uh, frankly, he, he stuck to his knitting. Most damaging, John's magazine began to fail, and his ability to live up to his father's legacy was questioned. John hoped to save his marriage. He wanted his magazine to thrive again, and he wanted to establish his own reputation. All he needed was time. The sun has set. It's now nautical twilight. It's hazy, but not totally obscure. It will be completely dark in 10 minutes. For now, John is still able to fly with visual references. As you get farther away from New York City, you're not going to be able to, to see lights that, enough to give you a straight line for the horizon. It's basically a black hole. Flying over water at nighttime, you pretty much lose that horizon. You're solely referencing your instruments. Twenty minutes from his destination, John has two possible routes. He can fly up the coast to Connecticut and Rhode Island, keeping the lights on the shoreline as a visual reference, and then turn south over Cape Cod to the airport at Martha's Vineyard. This route will only add five minutes to his flight time. Of all my trips I've made to Martha's Vineyard, I've always uh, flown that particular route because it puts you over water the least distance. Or he can take a riskier but shorter route and leave the coast and fly a direct line straight out over Rhode Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean, a distance of 34 miles from the airport at Martha's Vineyard. Choosing the route is a pivotal decision. OK, we're leaving the coast. John chooses to fly the direct route out over the ocean into the void. This choice will cost him his life. In just two minutes, John will be flying in complete darkness. In five minutes, he'll be dead. John is flying at 5,500 feet in complete darkness. He is 34 miles from the airport at Martha's Vineyard. He cannot see any visual landmarks, but he starts to descend. 9.39 p.m. There is still no sign of the lights at the airport. Can you see anything out there? No, no! John levels off at 2,500 feet and searches desperately for some visual reference, a light, a horizon line, stars, anything to give him a sense of direction. He starts to become disoriented. Spatial disorientation occurs when you don't refer to your instruments. And the natural tendency is to believe what your body is telling you. John does not have enough experience in his new plane and is ill-equipped to fly in these conditions. He relies on his instincts just when he needs to focus on his instruments. The plane now banks sharply to the left and climbs. 9.40 p.m. Trying desperately to compensate for the left bank, he turns the yoke hard to the right. Hold on. Hold on. The plane slides into a descent, speeding toward the ocean. No. Completely disoriented, John believes the plane is now level and yanks the yoke towards him to bring the nose up. Instead, the plane banks even more to the right. The engine races as it picks up speed and enters a freefall called the graveyard spiral. The Saratoga plummets towards the ocean. There is no way John can recover.
They, I miss him, you know, I miss, I miss the little boy I knew and, you know, I couldn't believe that he was going to finish this way. Coast Guard will resume its air search in the morning. Around the world, feelings of shock and disbelief resonate as news spreads of John Kennedy Jr.'s disappearance. The media descends on Martha's Vineyard as a massive search is ordered. I knew that he was dead. They had couldn't find them. Um, planes don't go missing. There is a suitcase with a business card and the business card attached to a little plastic insert within the suitcase is in the name of Lauren Bassett. John Kennedy Jr. died on the 16th of July, 1999. Six days later on the USS Briscoe, the Kennedys once again gather to bury one of their own as an entire nation mourns. With his death, the world will never know what his true contribution might have been. Thank you.